Now we're going to turn to our first panel of the day, which is Telling Tales, Rediscovering History. And we're delighted that Eddie Torres is going to be moderating the session. Eddie is the CEO of our partner organization, Grantmakers in the Arts, and he's been in that position since October 2017. Before that, he was the Deputy Commissioner for Cultural Affairs for the City of New York. And before that, he was a program officer at the Rockefeller Foundation. He's also served as a director of external partnerships for Parsons and the New School for Design, and has served on the arts and culture team at the Ford Foundation, as well as a member of the staff of the Bronx Council on the Arts. Eddie will be joined by Crystal Chanel Truscott, Sukeo Ross, and Nigel Redden to talk about taking a second look at history. Their bios are in your folders. They're also on the symposium website for those of you who are on live stream right now. And so please join me now in welcoming Eddie, Crystal, Sokeo, and Nigel. The Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot will go down as one of the two or three greatest genocidal mass murdering brutal regimes the world has ever seen. I was born in a Thailand refugee camp in the back of a truck. There was no hospital, they converted the trailer of an 18-wheeler into a medical center. I was a really sick child. The lack of medication didn't help either. In the refugee camp, I was given three names. Sokio, for a place filled with suffering, anguish, and confusion. The place of birth was called Srakao. Since I was a very sick child, they took me to a monk so I can get blessed. Vati was a name given to me by a monk who cured me of my sickness and named me for luck. Another monk named me Chuk for the presence of a flowery face. The color of my skin resembled the color of a lotus flower. As I got better, a lonely stranger tried to buy me for a child of his own, but my mother wouldn't let me go. She already lost six children. She was not going to lose another. Finally, they escaped to America, to California, then to Iowa. In 1986, we moved to Rhode Island. There were boarded up houses. Welcome to Hanover Street. On one end of the street, there was this plastic factory. And all you could smell was melted plastic throughout the whole street. Around the corner, chickens feed in a vacant lot. On the other end of the street, a prostitute walks out of the local whorehouse. Across the street, there was this liquor store. And there were always people outside. And this, this is my house, near the plastic factory. Gang members lived on the first floor. They didn't bother us. They worked at a dive factory with my father, and he drove them to work every single day. But during the summertime, they just sit and chill on the porch. But it would be hard for me to get in and out of the house. They would just literally do this. And I would have to just try to inch my way in just to go upstairs. And on my way back down, I didn't want to be rude, so <clears throat> what are you, the king around here? There was this nice green lemonade truck that went up and down my street, ringing its bell. Ring-a-ling-a-ling, ring-a-ling-a-ling. They served lemonade, pretzels, hot dogs, chips, soda, and drugs. There were bullet holes in my house, and my house was a target because it was a gang household. And they would shoot there, they would shoot there, and they would shoot there. I never got hit with a bullet. 
there was this car. They drove it right into my porch, set it on fire, and blew it up. There was this one kid walking down the street. I watched him get beat up. He was wearing a red shirt. I never wore red until I moved out of that neighborhood. Welcome to Hanover Street. <sighs> My father was in the Cambodian army. The Khmer Rouge were looking around to kill him. So him and his buddies went to the, went to the forest. They got rid of all their army clothes and wore whatever they could find. When they finally found him, they didn't recognize him. He told them that he was a fisherman. So the Khmer Rouge sent him into the forest to find fish to feed the people. He would only see my mother once a year. They gave him more rice because his work was hard. He would save it and try to get it to my mother so that she didn't starve. She would try to cook the rice and eat it secretly because if they found out, they would have killed her. Life was really hard for them. I had six brothers and sisters before I, even, before I was born. Two of them were twins. They passed away only two weeks old. Then she had another boy. Ended up having a seizure about eight months. And she had a little girl. They called her Slay Mom. They didn't want to give her a name because they didn't know how long she would last. She was almost three years old. After she passed, my father sat and cried for three days. And then there was another little girl. She passed away after two weeks old. Lack of starvation, lack of food, starvation, medication. I'm number seven. I was the first child to survive. So now we're gonna fast forward a little bit, because for time. Um, we moved to the United States, lived in a gang neighborhood. I thought life was normal. I thought that's how it was everywhere in the United States. Gang neighborhood, gang school, gang life. Things didn't change until we moved out of that neighborhood. And I found break dancing as a hobby. And I went to this place called Everett Company Stage of School. And the director, Dorothy, asked me, hey, you want to do an anti-tobacco educational school show? Eh, I don't know about all that. But you get free pizza or McDonald's. You get 15 to 20 bucks per show. And you get to skip school. Sign me up. I never told my parents. And that was the thing that changed my life. So if it wasn't for breakdance and hip hop performance arts, I'd either be dead or in jail. Um, and my parents are living better lives. They're, they have karaoke systems everywhere in their house. <laughs> and they enjoy their time. Every time they tell me their story, I was younger, it would go in one ear, out the other. It didn't finally happen until I went on tour in 2015. And in 2013, I started a project called From Refugee Camp to Project. This small exhibition turned into an actual tour. So um, I'm really honored to, to have this opportunity to speak with the three of you today. I've always um, joked around that uh, if I possess any one talent, it is the ability to surround myself with people who are smarter and more talented than myself. And this is a great example of that. So, um, you know, folks have seen everyone's bio, but what I'd like each of you to do, uh, starting with you, Crystal, um, is um, if you would just establish some context in terms of the work that you do, and then I'm going to ask you a second round of questions specifically about the projects that, that we're talking about today, you know, so in your case, Plantation Remix. And if you would give us a, a little bit about Progress Theater and also a little bit about your scholarship. Sure. Thank you, Eddie. Good morning. 
Um, I am so grateful that we started with performance. I think it's such a, a great way to start the, the morning. And I just want to invite you all to engage in a short performance with me um, in the tradition in um, African American black church, Southern tradition of call and response, which connects to Zeba's prompt to us to listen, which ultimately means that when someone calls, you affirm that you have heard and you listen by responding. So we'll just do a really short call and response performance, which essentially means that if I say good morning, you say what? Good morning. Good morning. That's it. Great performance. So, <laughs> um, so my name is Crystal Chanel Truscott, and I am from Houston, Texas, originally. My family has been in Houston, Texas, I like to say, eight generations on paper and more than that um, beyond. And so I feel very, very rooted and steeped in that tradition. Um, my company, Progress Theater, I started and founded as an undergraduate student at New York University. And uh, we have been touring for upwards of 17 years now. Um, we do a cappella musical theater, and I write what I call neo-spirituals. And neo-spirituals, particularly being in the tradition of um, Negro spirituals, field songs, they are the descendants of that um, aesthetic and practical tradition of art making and survival. Um, so they are descendants of, of spirituals, of field songs, of blues, of gospel music, um, and also in, in call and response with contemporary genre that we understand, uh, jazz and spoken word, hip hop, R&B, all of these types of things. I really felt always connected to sticking to um, a cappella. One of the things that's unique about African American um, uh, performance traditions and history, particularly people who are the descendants of folks who survived enslavement on this land, is that our ancestors were deprived of the drum. Right? And from that scarcity and abundance of art form and, and expression and, and communication came from that. Right, So that if you encounter performance traditions from the Caribbean um, or from Latin America that are connected to um, African descendants, there's going to be a drumming tradition. And in African American uh, performance traditions, there's not that, but there's a beautiful a cappella tradition. So neo-spirituals, for me, um, stays into that, in that context. So Progress Theater is a touring ensemble company that does a cappella uh, uh, musicals, neo-spirituals, neo specifically to um, using art as anti-racism and connecting disconnected communities and creating a space for people to engage in conversations that require empathy as a practice and as a rehearsal technique. Um, so how is that for a nutshell? Fantastic. OK, yeah. lovely. <laughs> And Nigel, if you could talk a little bit about Spoleto Festival, and then uh, when we go back around again, I'd like to talk you, you to talk a little bit about this specific project. Okay, uh, Spoleto, let's see, I'll try this one. Uh, Spoleto Festival USA is the offshoot of the uh, Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto, Italy, and I began working there, I'm sorry to say, in 1969, and um, uh, it was something that absolutely changed my life. The idea of the festival is that it would incorporate dance, music, theater, the visual arts, um, all kinds of music, and uh, that somehow each would reinforce the other. Uh, in 1977, Spoleto Festival USA was formed in Charleston. And Charleston is an extraordinary place to do a festival. It's a beautiful town, uh, but it's also a city with perhaps more of an impact um, given its size, than any other city in America. Ob obviously, it's the place where the Civil War started. It's the place where the plurality or the majority, depending on who you believe, uh, of enslaved people arrived in um, the colonies and then in the United States. Uh, it's also a place that really was very involved, very engaged in the arts. And one of the, uh, the uh, aspects of the festival is that we try to explore Charleston's history because in exploring Charleston's history, we're exploring America's history. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, art forms around Charleston, uh, Gullah music, uh, which came from the Sea Islands of, of South Carolina and to some extent of Georgia, uh, is something that was came from the Caribbean and West Africa and, and for the most part West Africa. Uh, there are uh, other traditions that came from Europe, and somehow it's impossible to think of certainly American music and American dance without thinking of those two roots. And in, in Charleston, we managed to um, 
uh, explore those in a way that I find quite fascinating. We've um, uh, also tried to uh, have people find out about Charleston itself. And for the most part, Charleston uh, is known as a kind of um, cookie box cover uh, look at beautiful houses that are rather large, that are right on the battery or um, uh, on the waterfront in one place or another. And we want to have people look at Charleston in a more comprehensive way, so that we've explored Charleston through the visual arts. Uh, we've uh, placed installations in various parts of, of the city to explain or to highlight um, uh, various parts of the city. Uh, sadly, uh, we had a, uh, a piece that was uh, a monument to Denmark Vesey, who had um, led a slave uh, rebellion, or tried to lead a slave rebellion in, 19, in 1822 in the portico of the Emanuel AME Church, which uh, must have been the, the, the man who did that horrible slaying, must have walked past it on his way into the church. Um, we've uh, had um, other um, installations in other parts of town that somehow give a, a much richer uh, idea of Charleston than um, one would get by simply doing the typical um, carriage tour of, of the downtown neighborhood. And I'll, at, at some point, I'll, the next time around, I get to talk about the specific project. <laughs> please, please. Great. And uh, so, Keo, could you talk a little bit, you know, you've obviously given us a really fantastic introduction to you. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about your process in terms of, you know, you went from, from growing up, you know, really not necessarily processing that your family was Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that this was something that you began to deliberately explore as part of your artistic practice, but also obviously part of your personal practice. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I mean, I, so the whole time when we get here, I'm, I'm thinking I'm like every other Southeast Asian person or Asian person, we're Buddhists. And that's all we think, and that's what we're made to think, we're Buddhists or you know, whatever the case may be. Um, I didn't find out till later on in about high school, 96, 97, that, I'm, that my family is Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. The whole village back in Cambodia, Muslim, same thing. But by that time, you know, teenager rebellious stage, in one ear out the other. So I didn't really care for it too much. Um, I didn't take into religion at all. We had Mormons coming to the house, trying to convert us, and just all these other things. And so I just gave up on religion and just focused on trying to be a kid and, and survive as much as I could. So the whole Muslim thing didn't even come back until 2013 when I decided to go back to college to finally get my um, bachelor's, right? Because, um, you know, I didn't gra graduate high school on time. I, didn't, I dropped out so many times from college. I had so many different majors like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But this time, um, they asked me to do an exhibition. And I said, yeah, cool. I can do an exhibition with my eyes closed. Uh, something that means something. I wanted to do like a fundraiser for my company. And they, my artistic director, Dorothy, was like, you know what, how about you do something a little bit more meaningful to you? And I've never gotten a chance to really tell my story or actually to learn my story. Um, so in 2013, I wrote a grant around State Council of the Arts. I got funded. Um, and then I started the whole exhibition. The exhibition is only about 15 minutes long. But with that money, of money, I decided to go to Cambodia for the first time. I was 33 years old. I went into this beautiful village. As soon as you enter the dirt road, the pavement is semi-paved, the rocks everywhere, kids running around. The first thing you see is this mosque. And um, it was intimidating to me because I've never really seen one. Um, and then as soon as the tuk-tuk driver, it's this little scooter with a carriage, drove down the village, um, there was this lady waiting there, and she was, um... Um, she... It was my grandmother. She had the hijab and everything. What I learned, what I thought I knew about Muslim life, the religion, the culture itself, was completely different than what I experienced. Um, she welcomed me with open arms and she gives me these things that we call them sniff kisses. They don't really put the lips on your cheeks or nothing. They just sniff your cheek. 
So it's like, it's, this is my face, it's one of those <laughs> kind of things. And I was like, oh, awkward. <laughs> and, um, you know, growing up, we didn't take into, because the Khmer Rouge destroyed everything. When I say everything, we mean everything. Family structure, love, life, arts, culture. You know, I can go on and on and on. And one of the things that was destroyed was the things that I felt from her. So after that, she went back to the village that she was pushed out of and tried to rebuild it. And they rebuilt it beautifully. I mean, they're in the same neighborhood, same village. Um, the mosque is there, everyone. So it's new to me. Uh, their prayers go out on the loudspeaker about five times a day. She cleanses herself. So I watched every single thing because this is all new to me. And this was something completely different than what I grew up thinking I knew it, right? And then from then on, um, as I was speaking to Zeba as well, we, I had a bigger and better appreciation for her lifestyle and what it was. And I broke down a little bit just because they passed away um, 2015, both of them, a month apart, as I was starting my tour. So it was, it was tough. Now, thank you for that. And, and you know, the, the theme of the panel is, you know, rediscovering history. But I, I mean, I think there's also just the element of uncovering history. I mean, so much of what you're describing is the extent to which your, your history was actually sort of preyed upon. You know, in, in your example, it was Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. But, you know, here in the States, it's uh, not only been the forces that have enslaved, you know, huge parts of our population, but also the, the forces that have educated or miseducated us ab uh, about our own history. Um, uh, Crystal, could you talk about Plantation Remix and, and you know, the, the information that you're uncovering and sharing with all of us? Sure. Um, so I think one of the sweetest surprises for me in um, even starting with Progress Theater and considering myself someone to be actively engaged in anti-racism work and diversity work was being put in the position to have to insert spiritual diversity as just as essential and important to conversations about inclusion around you know gender, race, age, all of these you know types of types of things, and um, because Progress Theater is a visibly multi-faith ensemble, um, walking into space, those began to be things that we felt privileged to be able to bring into conversation and in dialogue. And it also meant that we were able to really actively um, bring in um, audiences that identified with all of the ways, all of our intersecting identities. Um, so we often have a, a, a rich um, audience and followings, because some people's entry point will be that they're theater people, some will be that they're women, some will be that they're African American, some will be that they're Muslim, some, you know, all of these types of things. And so I've always just, um, enjoyed and appreciated and appreciated that aspect of doing the work. Plantation Remix, in its fruition, it's a piece currently um, in progress and in development, will be a site responsive, um, which is an, another way of saying site specific, but I think of responsive because the piece will have to respond to each site that it's at. Mm -hmm. And that specificity is the thing that will sort of bring out um, the core of what the experience will be at that site. But it'll be a site responsive, um, neo-spiritual that rehabilitates, reimagines, and re-envisions our entry point into plantation space and plantation legacy spaces, but also specifically the genre of plantation tourism. Right? So if anyone here has toured um, the South, you may or may not have seen advertisements for being able to go and view or tour a beautiful antebellum or a plantation home. And one of the things that's you know, particularly disturbing and, and what I find rather violent about a lot of these tours, and the tide is turning a little bit, but a lot of these tours is that you go into these spaces and what you're engaging with is a single story entry point to the space, right? So you're engaging with what I call like sort of the Southern Belle Disney princess version <laughs> of plantation space, which means look how beautiful everything is, look how beautiful our dresses are, look how luxurious life is, and how does it all happen? It just happens because it's beautiful, kind of like that Beauty and the Beast moment, like does the candelabra just come to life, right? <laughs> um, so that there is an active erasure and silencing of all of the bodies, all of the lives, all of the love, all of the labor that it took to make that lifestyle possible, right? And then that if we go even a step further back that we're also erasing and, and ignoring the first crime 
right, that happened. So the first crime, which I often like to start with, is in terms of thinking about rehabilitating plantation space. And even as we understand this black and white binary of looking at race and um, plantation history and legacy here, is that there was already trauma and, and crime that had to take place before that space became a plantation, right? So there was already the erasure and, and murder of First Nations people, just to clear that land. So the land has trauma on top of trauma, right? After the removal of folks and then bringing on, you know, um, people who were, who were enslaved with an additional trauma um, of enslavement that happened there. So, so twofold with Plantation Remix was one, what would it mean to rehabilitate this, this Disney princess experience and to tell those plantation stories with as many voices as possible um, that, that could make up the fabric of how we understand um, our history, um, our current moment, and reimagine our future. And the other is to think through this layering of, of history. If we could continually peel back, how can we peel back enough history through performance to get back to this essence of what it means to connect with land before trauma um, as a way of, of, of um, inspiring us toward this healing work that needs to happen so that we can enter these spaces. And instead of plantations being artifacts, places where people come to look at things, right, and remember things as they become these active spaces where people can engage in work and dialogue and connection that um, um, that, that, that brings us there. So Plantation Remix is not a, it's not a reenactment, it's not a historical reenactment. Um, it really is meant to be in call and response with past and present. Like all of my plays, it'll span time a bit. I'm an Octavia Butler fan, if anyone here knows Octavia Butler, so I love time travel. You know, and I just think that there's so much that we can gain from this practice of Sankofa and, and, and traveling through time. So essentially, the piece itself has six movements. It goes from plantation lullabies to this idea of what are our earliest memories and entry points into plantation space. And then through several movements, plantation education, um, examining the historical narrative of plantations through um, educational and personal school experiences, plantation legacy, uh, plantation afterlife, plantation resurrection, and plantation liberation. So um, I'm, I'm really e excited about this piece. It will take place at historic plantations, um, and there are you know several uh, plantation spaces and, and partners that are signed up for, to, to work with us on this piece. In every site, there will be the ensemble of Progress Theater, but there will also be a local community ensemble. So this idea of really engaging and inviting community to be stewards of this land and this space that is in their space and to tell the story with us. And so the piece is made anew in, in a sense um, at various sites. I think one of the things that I will share just about my journey to Plantation Remix, because it starts with Plantation Remix, but this uh, practice that I have of of remixing history or, or, or going back again, going back again to look at it, going back again to hear, going back again to listen, um, is, is a part of my cultural practice, you know, a part of African American tradition, but also a part of my scholarship practice and the way that I function um, as an academic. And so if I have time, I'll tell two quick stories that sort of lead up to um, plantation remix in, in, various, in, in various different ways. So one is that, um, so I'll, I'm trying not to go be too tangential, so bear with me. But you know, in hip hop culture, there is um, the practice of sampling. Anyone familiar with sampling? Yes, no, okay, yeah, okay. It's just like oh, hip hop heads in here, okay, I didn't know. So, um, but the idea that, for example, um, I'm a Nina Simone you know, fan, and so her song, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, right? And knowing that song and having an emotional relationship to that song means that when I hear contemporary artist Lil Wayne's song, Misunderstood, which, in which he's sampling her version, I have a different relationship to his song because I know her song, right? And so some people, you know, some of my students, I tell them that they'll bring me this Lil Wayne song, they're like, that's an amazing song, and I'm like, well, honey, you know, <laughs> let's, let's go back, you know, like, know the history of it. But this is also the process that I um, begin to engage in as a, as a student um, at NYU, which means that we need many eyes and many voices to look at our history because somebody's not going to recognize the sample. So example number one, um, I was taking a theater class, um, an African-American theater class, and we read several plays out of this anthology. And um, being the, the excellent student that I was, I would even read plays that we weren't assigned and came across this play by Du Bois called The Star of Ethiopia. And I'll read a, a little bit, because I, I wrote a piece that will 
be out soon in the Rutledge Anthology of African American Theater, just to tell you a little bit about this story of what it means when you have new eyes looking at a piece. And this wasn't the piece that we had we studied in class, but it was a piece that made me go, whoa, why aren't we studying this in class, and can't we be? So really quickly, October 22nd, 1913. Imagine Columbus Avenue between 61st and 62nd Street in New York City, the current location of the globally renowned Lincoln Center. Crowded with 14,000 spectators from near and far waiting in enthusiastic suspense for the cultural event of the year. Envision a cast of 350 performers donning colorful regalia to take attendees on a live action oratorical and musical journey through time. The artist has promised this performance as a celebration of unity and the powerful contributions of a people to the fabric of America. Halfway through the performance, the full crowd remains captivated by the spectacle. On stage, the drums roll and the herald proclaims, hear ye, hear ye, of the third gift of black men to this world, a gift of faith in righteousness, hoped for but unknown. It's October 22nd, 1913. The event of the year is the pageant play Star of Ethiopia. The third gift of the, of the Negro to the world being a gift of faith. This episode tells how the Negro race spread the faith of Muhammad over half the world and built a culture therein. In the audience is a 14-year-old Duke Ellington who leaves inspired and writes his first music composition the following summer. Years later at that same site, Lincoln Center will house music education programs and festivals bearing his name, but in 1913, Ellington is an unknown prodigy, a youth among thousands of spectator spectators witnessing this performance. The performance, uh, excuse me, the performance transition to, de to depict um, the battles uh, led by Askia the Great Muhammad, known for making the Songhai Empire the largest territory in West African history and eventually comes to the procession of Malian leader Mansa Musa, the, wealth, the wealthiest person of his time, in the world of his time. The priests proclaim, God is God, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. This impressive spectacle was viewed by thousands of people at each of his four showings in New York in 1913, in Washington, D.C. in 1915, Philadelphia in 1916, and Los Angeles in 1925. But who in the audience? And indeed, who in our contemporary times would have expected the third gift of the Negro, that of faith, to refer not to Christianity or the black church, but to Islam? So again, with the sample, myself as a student read that and went, whoa, right? Stop the presses. You know, we're looking at one of the greatest, you know, our greatest forefathers of, of history and cultural practice and knowledge and activism, who is saying in 1913, Right, that one of the greatest contributions of black people to the world, and certainly even in America, is Islam, and the performance of this that is happening on this massive scale with the likes of people that we still honor to this day. But people can read and read that play, and if you don't know the sample, right, if you don't know what's coming from that, then you have a completely different reference um, to that particular piece. So, um, Tom, can you, can you bring up really quick just some quick pictures of um, Star of Ethiopia? And then my last story. Um, just to connect to this. So that began kind of my scholarship journey, which meant, oh, not that one. I'm going to get there. That's, oh, it's, it's, it's okay. Here we go. Well, this is Du Bois's magazine, The Crisis. So this, again, is, you know, in the early 1900s, and he's having Muslim women on the cover of his magazine, right? And they're, they're black. Muslim women, which is something that we'd be hard pressed to find now. Whenever Muslims are represented in pop culture now, they're not going to be of African descent, usually. So, um, next slide, if it will, will it just cycle? Yep. So, this was a, a, a pamphlet for Star of Ethiopia, right? And again, sort of representing sort of this West African Muslim identity um, in 1913. And there will be one more, two more slides, maybe, of the actual cast. So, this is the company. Um, are a portion of the company because the company ranged in size from 350 people to 600 cast members in some spaces and places. Um, and if we could go back to the top of that slide because I just want to talk about the church for a bit. So um, discovering Du Bois's star of Ethiopia or rediscovering it, right, as, as our panel prompts, really said to me how important um, are are my eyes, my artistic eyes, my Muslim woman eyes, my black Southern woman eyes, to going back and looking at cultural gems and performative gems that could help us understand 
um, culture and history in a different way. So my scholarship was on was researching representations of spiritual diversity and particularly of, of Muslims in black reformers before 1950. Because 1950 you kind of get into the start of the nation of Islam and that is usually where people start when they start talking about um, black people who become Muslims. But as you can see, Du Bois was doing this in 1913. And so um, I that began kind of my start of looking at performance practices and plantations and music and trying to understand all of these connections. Um, early on when I was researching, I traveled to Natchez, Mississippi, which was one of my first experiences going on one of these Disney princess plantation tours. And um, discovered, I would keep getting referred to various plantations, various plantations in various churches, and wound up in Savannah, Georgia. Um, at First African Baptist Church. And it's kind of a story that's somewhat known now. You know, I mean, there's plenty of scholars who've done beautiful research, you know, on the presence of, of, of Muslims and um, enslaved Muslims um, in, here in America, although the stories still need to be more told. But one of the things that you find is that a lot of these churches built by enslaved peoples built facing east, facing Mecca. Right? And so I often like to say that the black church is one of our first examples of interfaith and multi-faith spaces. Right? But if we're not looking, if we don't know the sample, right, um, then we miss that. And then we end up looking at history as this um, monolithic spiritual space that it um, puts us in the position of having a lost opportunity of learning so much more. So this church um, in Savannah, Georgia, these pews here that you see in the balcony were uh, built by enslaved people. And they have Arabic writing. Um, on the side of the pews um, from people, the people who were enslaved from West Africa, practicing Muslims who this church became their worship space because that was the space. Can you go to the next picture? It gets a little bit closer. But again, I want to go back to the sample because before now, and there's been some, you know, there are ongoing conversations about this, even amongst the church itself, the Arabic writing would be referred to as Hebrew cursive. Right? It would be referred to as West African inscription, right? Which is all, you know, those are uh, not, you know, we could talk about those terms in, in various number of ways. But the point is, is that what does it mean that people are actively inserting faith, right, and cultural identity in a space that has become so much of a bedrock of what we understand, performance traditions that are connected to, um, to activism and to social um, um, organizing and uplift, you know, that we have now. So I'll pause. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. And Nigel, that's a, that's a perfect transition. Would you talk about about uh, uh, the piece that Rihanna and Giddens and uh, Spoleto are working on together? Well, I have to say, I, I'm sorry to be following you, Crystal. I thought that was very <laughs> impressive. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that I said earlier was that in, uh, at Spoleto Festival USA, we've tried to explore Charleston's history. And in 20, well, actually, it's now probably 2021, but in 2020, there was supposed to be a museum of Afri international African American museum created in Charleston. Uh, I mean, it, it's actually ironic that in Charleston there's a, a monument to the Holocaust, and there's very there's not a monument to uh, the Middle Passage. Uh, but clearly, this new museum will be some will will try to address that in some ways. Um, as part of the festival, we have want to in investigate history, especially when we have renovated a theater, um, just to make, to give the theater a history. Uh, we're renovating uh, one of the theaters, the Satili Theater, in, uh, which is going to be closed for the 1919, 2019 festival, but will reopen again in 2020. And um, uh, actually, it was, it was Zeba who had suggested that I look at the life of Omar Ibn Said. And I found the life of Omar Ibn Said to be absolutely fascinating, especially given the, uh, uh, the, the construction of the museum. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, he was um, sold in Charleston in 1807. He uh, was sold to a, um, a plantation owner, Mr. Johnson, who treated him badly and probably treated him as a field slave, which clearly he wasn't. He fled and went, got as far as North Carolina where he was jailed in Fayetteville. And, became a local sensation because he wrote in Arabic on the walls of his cell. Uh, and people came from all around to see this strange thing. This man had written uh, in this uh, 
I suppose, incomprehensible language uh, on the walls of his cell. And he was sold again to the brother of the governor of North Carolina, uh, James Owen, uh, who, according to him, according to Omar ibn Said, uh, treated him well. Uh, and he died still enslaved in about uh, 1860. Uh, he wrote an autobiography in 1831 which uh, was unusual, uh, to say the least. I mean, there aren't that many uh, autobiographies of, of slaves. Uh, he, uh, the autobiography, I've got a copy of it here, it's, um, which actually is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. He, um, it's not long, um, and he quotes extensively from the Quran. Uh, and it's unclear. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's... Um, uh, what you said earlier about you know knowing Jesus, I mean that, that somehow that if one is uh, Muslim, one knows Jesus. Uh, however, he's a prophet, not a not the the son of God. And it's it's unclear as to whether um, Omar ibn Said becomes Christian or remains Muslim. But in any event, he was uh, he he wrote not only this autobiography, but he wrote a, a number of other uh, uh, he wrote. Uh, not extensively, but he there are a number of documents the the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill um, from him. And there are a number of photographs as well. Uh, and I have to say that I was uh, I um, did not grow up in America and didn't take American history. Uh, so perhaps what I don't know about American history is obvious to all of those of you who did grow up in America. But it came as a huge shock to me that 30% that of the slaves might be Muslim, uh, that this was not something that was common knowledge for me. And I felt that it was extraordinarily important to make this point in, of all places, Charleston, South Carolina, that this is the major place to make that um, to make that point, we had uh, worked with Rhiannon Giddens um, quite often. She she is a, a singer songwriter. Um, she's won quite a few Grammys. Um, she uh, had actually studied opera at Oberlin, uh, and she'd come to the festival five times over the course of the last few years. And uh, I was we were chatting backstage and I, I, I mentioned this book to her and she said she'd love to get a copy, so I sent her a copy. And became, she became fascinated by the story. And I, we then asked her if she would consider writing an opera about it. And the, the reason for choosing Rhiannon is that she's, a Africa, she's an explorer of African-American culture. She's explored uh, African-American folk music. She's a storyteller. Um, she's an archeologist of music. And she also has a public. And one of the things that I think is extraordinarily important in telling this story is that, that it reach a large number of people. Uh, already, uh, there are a number of, of uh, other opera companies that wish to do it, including, I think, rather amusingly, the English National Opera, which, uh, I mean, there are American companies as well. But, uh, but I thought, you know, the English National Opera, well, huh. Um, and she uh, is writing the lyrics for this uh, particular piece. And as a storyteller, I think that you will do uh, an exceptional job. And fortunately, she also got a MacArthur um, a year ago, uh, so she has time, um, which, was, which was handy, because at a certain point, opera commissions are you know, a certain amount of money, but she, this is going to be a labor of love and a labor of, um, definitely of time. She is working with Michael Abels, who, who did um, uh, the music for Get Out, who is also someone who uh, is fascinated by the form of opera. Uh, because opera can tell a long story. It can tell a story that is not, uh, that, that can't be completed in four or five minutes of a, of a pop song, or even you know, in, in the side of an album. Um, it, uh, what it needs, what an opera provides, is, is some kind of uh, arc that uh, a composer and a librettist can provide. Uh, the piece now has um, a treatment, which Michael and Rhiannon developed, and which basically summarizes uh, Omar ibn Said's story. It's not 
a completely factual uh, telling of, of what's in the autobiography, but it's, it's enough so that uh, the audience will know that this is a man who came from Africa, came from, he was 35 or thereabouts when he was uh, captured. Which, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, if, you know, for those of us who, um, well, I'm actually a little older than 35, but, um, but uh, you think your life is formed when you're 35, and here he was just captured. Um, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He had been, he came from a relatively affluent family. He had been to a madrasa. He was a merchant of some sort, and to uh, be ripped out of uh, his life uh, was just, uh, sort of unthinkable. He doesn't actually talk about that in his autobiography. Uh, however, uh, Zora Neale Thurston uh, in Barracoon does talk about, uh, does interview the last slave who was brought into this country in, 1955, uh, in 1855. And I, I, we're also looking at that as a kind of a, a way of seeing what happened in Africa. Uh, the The kind of Trauma that, that that occurred in uh, when in, the, in 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 that case it was uh, the king of Dahomey who uh, uh, invaded the village and, uh, and uh, took everyone uh, and then shipped off a certain amount to a, a certain number of the people to America, which of course was illegal to do. But hey, um, I'm sure there were many illegal things going on. Um, so uh, it will be a story that. Um, needs to be told, a story that I think will be told in the right place to tell it, and will also be a story that we, we will be enlarging upon, because, I, again, in Charleston, it's important for many people to know their own history, whether they are African American or um, European American, to know that the, this history is more complicated than one would have thought that this, this man was an individual man. He was not, a, he was not one of millions of people or, um, well, I suppose it was 70,000 people who were brought in the last two years of, of the importation of slaves in, in uh, 1806 and 1807. Uh, he was not simply a, a number, but he was a, a man who had feelings, who had uh, a history, who had... Um, the right to a life which was taken from him. So um, I, I'm very excited about this, this production. Um, we are uh, holding a um, reading of the libretto in a, in a few months uh, in November, and um, I'm <laughs> hoping that it's going to be uh, extraordinary. But certainly I know that the, the story is extraordinary, and I know the music will be extraordinary. No, it's really, it, it's a fascinating uh, uh, story and it's a really important revelation. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that, that it was the 1720s before, you know, we began um, to take seriously the, the idea of a smallpox vaccination here in the States. And a lot of the challenge was um, our refusal to believe that it had actually been invented in West Africa. Um, it was actually uh, uh, something that had come from West Africans and the idea of West Africans as people who had educations, people who were scientifically innovative, et cetera, was just that hard for us to process. Um, the story that you're telling of not only the fact that you know we had uh, Muslims uh, here as slaves, but also they were people who were um, educated, uh, 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 you know, very well off in their home countries who were also captured and brought here as slaves is so anathema to what we have believed uh, and what, quite frankly, we've been taught. Um, there's also, you know, it's also related to, um, you know, one of the schools of, of racist thought here in the States. You know, on one hand, we have this school of sort of segregationist racist thought that you know, people of color are inherently born inferior. There's an also a complementary school of thought that is just as pernicious, perhaps more so because it's oftentimes peddled by people who are presumably uh, sympathetic, which is the sort of assimilationist thought, which is that, um, that the inferiority is in fact cultural. 
and can be corrected by, by acculturation into you know, European American culture. Um, and one of the earliest manifestations of that is the process of Christianization of, of African slaves. Um, and the presumption was that we are leading you away from either the devil or something comparable to the devil. Um, and it was also something that was happening during a time of great social change. And it was just easier to um, cast uh, anxiety away from the agents of that change, which were oftentimes uh, people with a lot of power and a lot of money, and to make it uh, from a class conflict to a spiritual conflict. And the easiest people to demonize were women and black people. You know, and this is how you had the Salem witch trials and the Christianization of slaves going on at the same time. If I can just make a comment about that, one of the things that, that has happened in Charleston in the, in the last 15, 20 years is that there's been an, an increasing emphasis on the uh, wisdom that was brought from West Africa with mm -hmm. West African uh, slaves that they knew about rice cultivation that they mm -hmm. knew how to cultivate rice in a way that the Europeans who lived in uh, Charleston did not. And so that the, um, I mean, one way of measuring value, of course, is the price that was paid, and um, which is an unfortunate way of looking at this, but uh, uh, West African, um, people from West Africa brought high prices because they were supposed to, they were thought to know much more about uh, rice cultivation, in fact, did know much more about rice cultivation. Um, so one of the um, one of the explorations that is going on in Charleston now is, is this whole um, issue of rice culture and, and what this means for African Americans. You know, I don't want to be greedy with your time. I think we have maybe 10, 15 more minutes together, and I just wanted to make sure that I opened it up for uh, for questions from the audience, if that's okay with all of you. Yes. Um, sorry, about um, telling the story of Muslim identity in Cambodia. Um, have you worked in this area at all? This is something that uh, I think Muslim life is growing on the surface a little bit because of outside influence um, in Cambodia, but I think the a counter narrative about we are all Buddhists. I'm mm -hmm. just interested in where what you've experienced in Cambodia um, and how that relates to your work here. So I don't um, directly work with um, any work with Muslims or anything like that. As far as if it's on the surface, um, not quite sure if it's on the surface like the way we want it to be. In Cambodia, I mean. When the um, Khmer Rouge came in, when they destroyed everything, obviously, Muslims were one of them. They were executed a lot. Most that were executed were Muslims. Um, so you had a choice. After the whole war thing was done, 79, the Vietnamese came in, you had a choice either to really go back and rebuild or leave and go to the United States being sponsored. And rebuilding means there's, that survival mode is still in you, right? So um, what was destroyed, all these mosques and everything were destroyed. Um, it's still where it's at, you know what I mean? And we're talking about, you have all these amazing, elaborate, beautiful Buddhist temples everywhere throughout Cambodia, but for mosques, they're segregated. They have their own little villages and this and that. You won't see them in um, a public place. I mean, they're in a public place, but you won't see them like in Phnom Penh, the capital city. And if they are, they're either isolated in their own little towns, little village, and that's completely it. They're not out there like that. So for Cambodians, we have a word for, um, well, they have a word for Cambodian Muslims, which is called cham. Even coming here, again, my parents were in survival mode, right? So they chose to completely disregard everything else and try to make life happen um, because there's only five of us in the whole United States from my family here. Well, you know, then there's my daughter and my nephew, but that's basically it. So survival was on their mode. Religion was not. Um, they gave that all up when people were being executed. And even here, you still don't see them. Um, and my mother, who worked in a factory a little while back, I don't know how they can tell by your name, but her name is Vanna Sam. Um, 
the, the Cambodians would make negative remarks. Um, oh, she's a John person, this, this, and that. Um, but then we don't understand, too, that the people that we brush shoulders with might have been part of the uh, Khmer Rouge army mm -hmm. that came in on the way. And we don't know that. Um, and then going back to that, everything is not on the surface. Even though Cambodia is more open to everything nowadays, um, Cambodia is also behind because of the war. You know, they literally had to rebuild the whole country all over again, rebuild life. And not just life as in trying to survive, but life as in the culture, the arts. The main focus was getting Cambodia back to its ancestral Apsara kind of like life, which did not include Muslim life, right? And they're doing the same thing here. Um, but I have seen and I have worked with a Muslim Cambodian American woman named Anita Yuli, who is an amazing artist, poet, um, highly educated. She moderated one of my shows in um, Connecticut. And she does a thing called, I forgot the name of it, but the big orange bug or the big, um, she wears this big hijab and it's orange. It, it's literally about 10 to 20 feet long. And these all installation pieces that she'll set up and, it's, and then she'll tell the whole history of that. Um, so that work has been doing that. Most of my work has been mainly with a lot of the youth who have been going, are going now from what I went through. What we don't talk about, whether you're a Muslim American, Muslim Cambodian, or growing up in the neighborhood like I did and had to survive, what we don't talk about is the trauma that they've went through and how it's passed on. And nobody talks about that at all because of the stigma, you know, and growing up the way we did survival mode, it's don't talk about it, just go out there and try to make the best of what you've got. Unfortunately, um, there's no healing. And even me now, you see me break down a little bit. Um, the healing process is a lifelong process. Not that you're not going to get there, but um, with Muslim Cambodians, it's harder because there's, there's still um, kind of like behind the curtain a little bit, so to speak. And you don't see them out there heavy, um, especially what, what I thought I knew about Muslims in general. You know, so that's still being taught out there, and, and, you know, and I didn't know, I didn't fully understand it. So I'm not equipped to go into that field. I do want to learn more about it personally, um, but my work is, mo is mainly with the youth and storytelling and performance and getting them to tell their story no matter what. Um, uncensored, well, censored as if it's in schools and stuff, but um, <laughs> we want to make sure that their story is told and working with kids in middle schools with trauma and kids in, um, who are incarcerated youth and um, from my kind of community and other different communities, they, everyone has some kind of struggle that they're going through, but nobody's hearing it. That same thing with um, Zahir, when you posted it up, um, pass the mic, right? We gotta pass the mic to these kids, man, so they can get it out there and so we can start the healing process and break this cycle of really not talking about what we need to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for the uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, my question is for Crystal. Um, thank you again for, for showing us your work. I'm really interested in the concept of sampling um, as both methodology and a performative practice. And since your work is so deeply rooted in history, many histories, um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the research that goes into creating work like Plantation Remix or other performance pieces, um, what your process is. Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, how to be concise when you ask an artist about a process. But what I'll say, um, because I think part of it, a large part of it starts in um, what Zaheer reminded us of, of intimate knowledge, right? Um, so there is like sort of an, an academic, anthropological, ethnographic process, right, that I can employ. But when you're looking for the sample, the sample really requires relationships and intimate knowledge, right? When you, um, when you research and when you connect with spaces, connect with history and connect with people across cultural, um, uh, cultural identity. So for example, if I'm thinking about um, so in Houston, one of the spaces uh, sites that will be used for the piece is a park called Emancipation Park, um, which was purchased by formerly enslaved people after emancipation as a space to celebrate Juneteenth. 
right, which Juneteenth um, is the only nationally recognized holiday, and I don't know if, it, if nationally recognized is the best way to describe it, that commemorates the ending of slavery, um, um, which is June 19th, 1865, which is when word came to the coast of Galveston two years after the end of the Civil War um, that informed folks, my ancestors, that this um, freedom had come. Freedom had come. Um, so, um, but, so I happen to know a, a, about, about that story um, from kind of, it's not a story that's gonna be in a textbook. Right now, it might be slowly getting into textbook, but by talking to um, elders in this relationship, intimate knowledge type of space, and in that call and response, I'm gonna get various levels of information. So one of the stories that came out of doing that research kind of on the ground and looking for the sample, like what's the thing that I'll see that someone else won't see, is that adjacent to Emancipation Park is a site called the El Dorado Ballroom. And the El Dorado Ballroom was like the cotton club in Houston, Texas, y'all, okay? And my grandmother actually used to dance there, right? And what I learned from, again, intimate knowledge and, and oral history um, is in talking to my parents and other folks in the community is that the El Dorado Ballroom was also the first space in Houston where Muslims were praying, were allowed to play, pray. So it was a nightclub, it was a social space, and then on Friday, it was the mosque. Right? And that that was housed in the African American community um, during segregation, during all of those things. And that's a sample that someone's not going to find without intimate knowledge and without relationship, right? And without, and without hearing all of these types of things. And I, I really kind of like your point in terms of our conditioning about where knowledge comes from, right? And how easily we can be blinded and miss these opportunities for saying, well, gosh, there's going to be information there, but you won't know it, one, if you don't believe that it can be there, and two, if you don't know what to look for. So I would say, one, it would be that that sort of um, that way of kind of going in deeply um, and, and listening and having having those kinds of conversations. The other is that, um, the, or the other that I'll share um, in terms of process and in terms of, of sampling is the importance of having as many voices in the room as possible. So on the surface, someone will hear something like plantation remix and will say, "Well, gosh, you know, what might this have to do with someone who is just entering the country and pursuing their identity as a new American?" Right? And as I've gone through this process, one of my favorite things to uncover and experience and, and learn about was a, a citizenship naturalization ceremony that happens at Monticello um, uh, in, in, in Virginia. And so this idea of what does it mean to look at plantation history and narrative from that entry point, right? That for someone, their first entry point into America is having this ceremony at this space and inheriting everything that comes along with it, right? Whether you know it or not, and, and how that kind of falls into formulating an identity and a way of moving through, you know, through the country in this way. So that's going to be a different sample, you know, um, in that way in terms of what does it mean to enter space and to have that be um, your entry point to, into, into citizenship. So, um, so yeah, so I think that there, there can be, you know, many other places. And then, you know, we could have a whole other conversation about process in terms of, of music and, and connecting communities and, um, and what it means to build ensemble um, over time in a way that's in call and response with sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there was one other question at the end. We have time for just one more. Thank you, and, and thanks to all of you for your, um, your uh, stories and sharing your, your projects with us this morning. I'm particularly interested, um, Nigel, in the, the opera uh, on Omar Ibn Said, and I'm wondering, sort of in the same manner as uh, Crystal's approaching Progress Theater's work with Plantation Remix, how you think about um, those activities that might happen beyond the proscenium um, stage, providing those points of opportunity for connections to be made for folks to recognize the sample as it were. Well, one of the things that we're doing is providing a context which involves other artists as well. So that uh, we have um, Fred Wilson is the distinguished African-American artist who uh, was the American representative at the Istanbul Biennale, or biennial, I suppose. It's the Venice Biennale, it's the Istanbul Biennial. And who, who did a piece called Afro-Kismet, which involves um, Ottoman, uh, 
designs and uh, Arabic language um, saying black is beautiful. Uh, it, it is a, an installation that we will uh, provide in Charleston at that same time. We're also hoping to, I, I don't know whether this will be possible, one of the things that I'm hoping will lead up to this is that um, our office is uh, actually a mansion that was built, um, that was paid for by Thomas Pinckney, uh, who, was, who ran for president at one point, and his brother, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, um, actually uh, almost uh, became vice president. Um, but the, the, the will, uh, his will says he paid too much for the, the house, and that it cost $50,000 plus the work of two Negro slaves for 20 years. And I'm sure there were others who, who did that as well. And what I'm hoping is that we can do an exhibition of Titus Kapar's work, who uh, is very much about revealing the, uh, the fact that, uh, that African Americans were not identified. I mean, they were simply a Negro slave. Uh, and, and not given any personality. His, his work, uh, if you don't know it, it involves very beautiful kind of a 19th century rendition of costumes uh, and clothes. I mean, really quite beautiful. And then a face that is, com among other things, a face that's completely, has no, uh, no features, simply black. Uh, and I think doing that in a, in a building that um, uh, was... Uh, that has the history that it, it does is, is particularly interesting. We also happen to have a, a, a monument to the rice culture in the, in the garden of the building, which is actually sort of fascinating in its own way. Uh, but we are working with uh, imams in Charleston, and there are, there's an African-American imam, and there's a, there's a, um, uh, a Middle Eastern imam. Uh, but we're also uh, doing things with, um, elementary school students uh, with the music. Uh, and whether they will learn the story, I, well, I hope they will learn the story as they, they hear the music. But we, we've got a pretty extensive education program that is basically aimed at uh, primary school students. So I want to say thank you to all three of you. And again, to give you a big round of applause. We really appreciate it.